Hi all, Mr. Kolakowski here. We're going to look at our lesson for today, sound. This is going to be broken into two parts. The first part is the more significant, uh, the more detailed of the two videos I have for this particular lesson. Let's jump into this. The first idea we have is what is a sound wave? What makes it different than light or water? What is a longitudinal wave? So sound is a traveling energy disturbance. What that means is, like any wave, it is a, a, an energy that propagates through a medium. But in this particular case, as the wave propagates through the medium, the particles move parallel in the same direction as the propagation of the wave itself. Let me show you a video of this. If you could imagine each of these lines is a molecule in the air, and this over here is a vibrating vocal cord or a vibrating string, looks like a plunger, but this could be anything that's vibrating. It could be a tuning fork that's vibrating. And what's happening is you're getting these high and low pressures. If I pause right about here, you'll notice that we have a high pressure a low pressure in the middle, and another high pressure. If we measured from here to here, that would be one wavelength, one complete cycle. It doesn't look like crest to crest or trough to trough. This is not a transverse wave, but it still has wavelength. We'd still be able to measure frequency, period. We'd still be able to use V equals F lambda. Wave speed is frequency times wavelength. Everything would be the same. Constructive destructive interference is possible, but it doesn't have that same shape as we saw with transverse waves previously. So, as it says here, sound waves are longitudinal waves. They're pressure waves comprised of compressions and refractions. Compressions are high pressures. That's where the particles are, are grouped really tightly. Refractions are low pressures. That's where the particles are spaced out a little bit more. So to create sound waves, you need uh, something that vibrates, right? It could be a vocal cord, a guitar string. It could be uh, something like you drop a pen and the pen vibrates, creates a twang sound. In this case, I have a tuning fork here. And the tuning fork, when you strike it, is going to wiggle back and forth. It creates a uh, variation in air pressure around it. That energy propagates through the air. The air molecules collide into each other, creating pressure oscillations. The frequency under which the vibration occurs, so tuning forks all have their own unique frequency, is going to create um, either a high or low pitch. So for example, when I think of a high pitch, I think of a flute. When I think of a low pitch, I think of a tuba or something like a deep voice or something bassy. Um, frequency is measured in hertz. Um, it's something that we would say um, for, the, for the human ear, we could, and now this depends from uh, animal to animal, but we are able to hear from 20, 20 hertz on the low end up to 20,000 hertz on the high end. Uh, anything that's below 20 hertz is called infrasonic. Anything that is beyond 20,000 hertz is ultrasonic. Um, for example, an ultrasound uses sound to sort of gather images, um, and those you can't hear the frequency under which that machine works because it's higher than 20,000 hertz. The screech of a bat is higher than 20,000 hertz. Um, high pitch is a, like a, think of a, a, a high pitch uh, screech. Uh, on the other hand, low pitch, like a, a deep, deep tuba, uh, bassy sound. Um, those are going to be objects that vibrate a little bit slower. Um, things that vibrate faster give you the high pitch. Things that vibrate slower give you the low pitch. Uh, both of those circumstances create a pressure wave. And um, I have a, well, before I uh, go down any further here on the notes, it says, does frequency affect V or the wave speed? Well, I said a moment ago that you can still use V equals F lambda for sound waves, even though they're not transverse waves, they're longitudinal waves, you still use this equation. 
Well, let's think about that for a second. It says here that velocity of sound in air depends on temperature. So the equation that we have is, uh, this is also in the textbook, of course, the speed of sound in air is equal to 331 times the square root of T divided by 273K. So K stands for Kelvin, the temperature in Kelvin. That's the official international system of units way of measuring temperature. It's effectively the Celsius scale shifted by 273 units. So if we were at zero degrees Celsius, that's equal to 273 Kelvin. We would plug in 273 Kelvin into the numerator here. 273 divided by 273 is equal to one. The square root of one is equal to one. Multiply that by 331. The speed of sound in air that is really cold, zero degrees Celsius, would only be 331 meters per second. However, if you plug in room temperature, which is 293 Kelvin, you take this number here, you add 273 to it. 293 divided by 273, take the square root of that, multiply by 331, you end up getting 343 meters per second. That is the speed of sound in room temperature air. It doesn't matter if it's a low pitch or a high pitch. You could have a tuba, you could have a flute. Both of those instruments in a concert hall, assuming that concert hall is at room temperature, those waves will pass from point A to point B across the room at 343 meters per second. Now, if the air was warmer, let's say uh, it's a really, really warm day, the air moves faster, the medium is different, kind of like if you take a guitar string and you tighten it, you change the tension, you're affecting the medium by which the wave pulse propagates through the guitar string. When the air moves faster in warm air, the wave, the sound wave is able to pass a little bit better. Uh, the energy is able to propagate a little bit better and therefore the speed of sound in air is faster in warm air than it is in a little bit cooler room temperature air. It says here velocity also depends on the medium itself. Well, that's true. Uh, before I, uh, I get into that idea where we are going to notice the speed of sound is fastest in solids, a little bit faster uh, in solids than liquids, and a little bit faster in liquids than in gases, let's take a look at this question again. Does frequency affect the speed of sound? No, it does not. Uh, what would effectively happen is if a sound wave let's say um, went from 40 hertz to 80 hertz. So it went from a lower sound pitch to a little bit higher pitch sound. Uh, the wavelength will be cut in half. So you're not gonna get a greater wave speed. You're just gonna change uh, the wavelength, which mean, and the frequency obviously changed if it doubled, which means in, in the end, you get the same wave speed. So what does affect the speed of sound waves? It's the medium. So the medium itself affects the speed of a wave. Changing the air temperature is effectively changing the medium. Hot and cold air are really different media for air, uh, for sound waves to pass through. Uh, I have a, a chart I can show you. Oops, let me see if I can find that uh, over here. Uh, this first picture is, uh, this is a, a pressure wave. You can see that uh, this is a crest to crest wavelength. This is a high pressure to high pressure. Um, that's really not the thing I want to show you guys though. What I'd like to show you is this. Okay, this is the speed of uh, sound in room temperature air. And if we look over here, the speed of sound in fresh water is 1,482 meters per second. Uh, if we kind of con continue that story, and the speed of sound through steel is 5,960 meters per second. Um, this really has to do with the concept we see right here, which is to say that in general, when you have a more dense medium, you have stronger interactions between the atoms. Think of dominoes that are in closer to one another. The energy propagation is, is more efficient, and you get greater. Uh, speed of sound through, say, a steel beam much faster than, uh, say, through um, air. Okay, let's finish up this, uh, this video. And uh, I have a sample problem over here for you guys. Uh, the sample problem says, on a hot summer evening, you see a flash of lightning. 
we've all done this before. You see the flash, and then there's a delay, and you hear the rumble of the thunder. So it's a hot summer evening. You see a flash of lightning. Speed of light is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Uh, really, really, really fast. Uh, a million times faster than the speed of sound. The sound of the thunder, so this is a sound wave propagating through air, is heard two and a half seconds later. Estimate how far from the lightning bolt you are. Let's go through this together. If you'd like to pause the video to try it on your own, do that now. Welcome back. If you hit pause, let's go through how to make this estimate. So first thing we have to do is figure out the speed of sound in this warm summer air. It's not going to be 343 meters per second, which is, we can kind of assume if the problem didn't give you a temperature, you'd assume um, on a regular day, you could probably estimate room temperature. But this is a, a unique question. They want to know what's happening on this hot summer evening. So we're going to plug in 303 Kelvin. The way that you get that is you add 273 to 30 to get 303 Kelvin. We plug that into the numerator. Uh, divide 303, uh, divide uh, 273, um, 303 divided by 273, take the square root of it, multiply by 331, you get 349 meters per second. Now that is the speed of sound in that warm air. If we assume that the lightning bolt light is pretty much instantaneous from when the lightning bolt takes place and we see it, the delay comes from the fact that the speed of sound isn't moving uh, as fast, okay? It's a million times slower. So let's plug in that 349 meters per second into our uh, velocity as displacement per unit time equation. Uh, two and a half seconds is the delay in this particular case, and you end up finding it to be 873 meters, which is less than a kilometer. A kilometer is actually less than a mile. So you're only 870 meters from this thing. It's not that far away. Um, sometimes people estimate you know the delay you know two and a half seconds that means that the lightning bolt is miles and miles away no uh, that's only true if there's a large large delay in the time from which you see the lightning flash with your eyes and then you hear the rumble with your ears uh, you have to have a pretty significant delay in those two things happening for you to be a mile or miles and miles away from that actual lightning bolt i'm going to stop the video at this point uh, just to kind of do a quick check over here. Um, I wanted to go back to that previous picture right here. Um, just to have a, a final comment right here, if this is what a sound wave looks like, here we have a speaker that's vibrating at a particular frequency. Um, again, you can use the equation V equals F lambda. You can do all the things that you would do with a transverse wave uh, using uh, frequency and period to describe the propagation of the wave. It's really the same physics, interference, standing waves, all of those things are possible. It's just, it doesn't have the same look as what we saw in our original lessons with uh, pulses through uh, of waves through strings and things like that. Okay, on to the next uh, video. Not as fundamental as this one, but uh, I'll catch you soon on that next video. Bye-bye.